The old city hall on Prospect Street is Bellingham's most iconic architectural landmark. Built in 1892 in a late Victorian style, it was city hall for New Whatcom, a municipality created in 1891 out of the pioneer towns of Whatcom and Seahome. After consolidation with Fairhaven in 1904, it became Bellingham City Hall, a role it would serve until 1939 when a new city hall opened on Lottie Street. Having dodged the wrecking ball more than once, it's been a museum since 1941. So let's go inside and have a closer look at the history of this amazing building. In 1891, the communities of Fairhaven and New Whatcom on Bellingham Bay were enjoying an economic boom. There were rumors of railroads coming and new industry, and the new city council of New Whatcom wanted an ornate city hall pretty much to show up its rivals in Fairhaven. So they accepted the plans of Alfred Lee for a ornate $50,000 city hall building. Unfortunately, uh, during construction, the economy headed into depression, and by the time the building opened on May 8, 1893, for the first city council meeting, the building on the interior wasn't completed above the first floor, and that first council meeting had to be in this room. Because the building wasn't completed on the interior above the first floor, meant that the city council had to be packed in here with the comptroller's office, which was on this side of the room. This is uh, now our Gallery 5. This would have been an open bank of windows letting in all kinds of natural light. Uh, now, of course, covered for gallery space. The comptroller's vault would have been back here. You can still see it outlined in tape. And this is the situation it was up until uh, 1909 when the building was completed above the first floor and the city council could finally move upstairs to the place it was originally designed to be. Across the hallway, under this arch, is the old treasurer's office. And there was a counter here where the public would come in. And this is a original safe for the treasurer's office, still in its original location. And this is where, of course, the city kept all its money. Looking a little empty these days. And then right this way was the entrance into the police court. This used to be uh, the police court, it was called, kind of the predecessor to municipal court today. The police judge had a very small office back on this side, and in front here would have been the courtroom. Open windows on this side, and the main entrance to the court was a door here that came in from underneath the main stairway. At the back of the room was a direct entrance to the chief of police's office. Today in the Chief of Police's office, we have an exhibition of Darius Kinsey logging photographs and a display of historic postcards. Across the hallway from the relatively large Chief of Police office was the small mayor's office. Poor mayor had this little confined space uh, all the way up until 1909 when a larger mayor's office was finally completed on the second floor. The hallway here is still lined with its original maple panels, which for much of its his history was painted in industrial green. It took a lot of work to get that paint off of here. This is also the original staircase, uh, hand carved out of oak with mahogany inlays. So let's go upstairs. 
You know, the whole time this was City Hall, they didn't have an elevator. So it's fun to think of how many people have climbed these stairs over the years. It wasn't until 1909 that the city hall was completed above the first floor, and this became the city council chambers as Alfred Lee had originally designed. The new city council space was well lit by a bank of windows back here, now covered because it's now gallery space. Uh, in addition, there was a new larger mayor's office over on this side, as well as a city attorney's office, and this entire side was dedicated to the city engineering department. This would be the home of city government until 1939 when a new city hall was opened on Lottie Street. Even before uh, the city government moved out, there were those concerned about this building because there were those who just wanted to tear it down. But the Bellingham Museum Society under the leadership of John Edson was formed to save this building and turn it into a museum which it was in 1941. Today this space is the rotunda room of the Whatcom Museum and used for all kinds of public performances and musical programs. Just off the council chambers was the engineering department's drafting room. This is where engineers drew new streets, water lines, and sewers uh, for the city of Bellingham. And the drafting room was located here to get exposure to all this natural light uh, that came in through these windows. And it was determined that the west side of the building, of course, got the majority of the daylight as the sun went over Bellingham Bay. Here on the third floor is the gallery to the city council chambers below. It has the original cedar railing as well as one of the original iron columns that are throughout the building. Now, the city council never did find the time to allocate any money for a working clock in the tower. Today, the Wacom Museum has a display of watches and clocks. It's our attempt to make up for lost time. In 1995, the museum finally acquired an E. Howard tower clock. It's the exact type of Victorian clock that would have been used in the clock tower back in 1892 had they gotten one. When it arrived, however, it was just too pretty to stick up in the clock tower where no one could see it, so it was installed here on the third floor and hoped that it could operate the clock up in the tower. On December 10, 1962, the Bellingham Public Museum suffered a catastrophic fire that burned off the clock tower. It was later determined that the cause of the fire was faulty wiring. The museum was closed for six years and it took a 12-year effort of community fundraising to get the tower redesigned by architect George Bartholik, who used old photographs to create an exact replica of the original clock tower. Today, here in the attic, you can still see uh, the charred timbers. The old growth beams were found to be stout enough to be reused in the rebuilding of the clock tower, which we're going to now look at by going up this spiral staircase. And here at the top of the spiral stairs, we find the 700-pound, three-foot diameter bronze bell that's original to the building. Uh, it was reinstalled here back in 1998. It uh, doesn't ring right now, uh, but this still isn't as high as you can go in this tower. You can climb up to the clockworks at the top of these stairs. Wow, it's a long climb to the very top. Uh, here we are in the clock tower with the clockworks. This is the very pinnacle of the museum building. And this is what had burned off back in 1962. And it did take a 12 year effort to get this tower rebuilt. And when it was finally done, Pat Fleeson, chairman of the museum board and who had been so instrumental in raising the money and activating the community to 
restore the museum building, she painted, we did it on a sheet, which was then flown from the top of the tower. Well, as I mentioned, there has never been a working clock here in the tower. For most of the building's history, clock faces were merely painted at a static seven o'clock, uh, which those wooden clock faces inevitably blew out. And uh, for many years, uh, pigeons and starlings and other birds like to come in here and have little birds. It was quite a mess. Uh, you can see an attempt here made with our E. Howard Tower clock to get these modern clock faces working. So if I want to, I can set this to the historic time of seven o'clock, which for all people out on Prospect Street should be kind of freaky. So the tower has three clock faces, but the west side of the tower has this awesome view from a porthole. And this is a hole you can see uh, in early photographs, looking back at the tower. Of course, the hole you see in those early photographs was open, allowing the birds in. When this was City Hall, the basement was occupied by the police department and the jail. Entrance was by way of this staircase and door. You came to the desk sergeant's desk, which would have been right here. Over on your right were the patrolman and detectives offices. But if you were unlucky enough to have to go to lockup, this was the jail. And there are some residual signs that this was the jail. These have been converted to offices and storage now. Uh, but this was the uh, major lockup. There was a large cage in here, which could hold up to eight inmates. This side was called uh, the bunk room, and this is for more long-term accommodations. On this side was the women's lockup, overseen by Bellingham's first female police officer, Edith Fuller, who was the police matron. And on this side, uh, during Prohibition, this was the booze vault where contraband liquor was kept. After Prohibition, this became a padded cell. Down here, under the stairs is the janitor's closet, uh, which is still a janitor's closet. See, some things don't change. Now, up until 1926, the jail did not have a shower facility for inmates. So once a week, whether they needed it or not, they were taken out back and hosed down by the firefighters from next door. In 1926, a shower was installed. It's back here. I don't know if I want to go in there. And on the original blueprints, this was called the dungeon. So the new shower was in the dungeon. Now City Hall was often plagued with mice. And to combat the mice problem in City Hall, a number of cats were introduced. Charlie Bornstein had as many as four cats in City Hall in 1909. And in 1922, probably the most famous City Hall cat, Bill, the black cat, uh, patrolled for the police department every night throughout the jail and upstairs. So if you'd been here back in the day when this was City Hall, you'd probably see some cats wandering the hallways. City, City Hall did not have an elevator, so it's only appropriate that um, we go upstairs the old-fashioned way. Exhibitions of history and art come and go inside the museum, but there's one artifact that remains on permanent display, the Old City Hall, catalog number 1939.1.1. Yes, the building itself is a museum piece.